I never thought working late at Barker's dry cleaning would be part of my Halloween plans, but here I was, standing behind the counter like a sentry in a fortress of detergent and static cling. My boss had insisted, saying we'd be the only laundromat open past the witching hour. It'll be a gold mine, he'd chuckled, handing over the keys and practically shoving me into the night shift. Never mind that his idea of a gold mine involved me being stuck here alone while the rest of the world indulged in candy costumes and good old-fashioned frights. With double pay promised, I found myself agreeing, reluctantly swapping my plans for a cozy horror movie marathon at home for a night of sorting other people's dirty laundry. To pass the time, I'd put up some sparse Halloween decorations. A cheap plastic skeleton swung from the ceiling, leering down as though relishing my imprisonment here. I even managed to arrange a couple of fake cobwebs on the windows, though their synthetic nature only made the place look even more artificial, more sterile, and paradoxically, even more haunting. The buzzing of the fluorescent lights began to wear on me, their relentless flicker creating an unsettling rhythm like the pulse of the building. Time began to distort. The clock's ticking seemed to grow louder with each minute that passed. It was as though the universe was conspiring to remind me how alone I was. I started to think of my family back home, cozy and safe, gathered around the warmth of our living room, probably watching one of those horror flicks I'd been looking forward to. I sighed, imagining the contrast between their laughter and the unsettling stillness surrounding me. The place wasn't big, a single row of washing machines on one side, dryers on the other, and a small counter where I stood, my fortress in this laundromat of the damned. Yet the more I stared at the walls, the more they seemed to close in on me as if the building itself was growing impatient, restless, eager for something to happen. Oddly, the night had been relatively busy at first, older folks mostly telling me they were grateful for the laundromat being open. They were relieved to escape the chaos of trick-or-treaters and pranks that usually populated the streets. By 10 p.m., the place had emptied, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the low hum of the machinery. But just when I was resigning myself to a lonely, albeit mundane, night, the door creaked open and my world tilted on its axis. A disheveled man walked in, stinking of booze and something herbal that I couldn't quite place. His clothes were torn and ragged, and he carried a black trash bag that seemed to sag with a mysterious weight. My stomach churned. I felt my pulse quicken. I took a deep breath, steadying myself for whatever would unfold in this midnight chapter of my Halloween saga. And so it began a night that would defy explanation, plunging me into an abyss of fear and mystery that not even the brightest of fluorescent lights could illuminate. This Halloween, Barker's dry cleaning would live up to its haunted promise, revealing a darker underbelly that I had never fathomed. My life was about to change, and what grim tales would unfold in this seemingly mundane corner of the world. The clock ticked on, and I braced myself. It was going to be a long, haunting night. Hey, just a heads up, we're closing soon. You can wash, but drying might be tight on time, I informed the stranger cautiously, masking my unease with professionalism. He grunted in acknowledgement, seemingly undeterred. Slowly, he began to unpack the dark trash bag, revealing clothes that were saturated in a liquid so crimson it could only be blood. Fresh, dripping blood. The air grew cold. A chill crept down my spine. Oh, you got bleach, he mumbled, not meeting my eye. Ye yeah, sure, I stuttered, pointing to a small shelf stocked with cleaning supplies. He purchased a bottle and returned to his foul chore. Curiosity and dread mingled within me. Is that real blood? I found myself asking, instantly regretting my audacity. Ah, uh, I'm a butcher, he replied nonchalantly, as if this would put my mind at ease. Long day at the shop. Got messy. I nodded, pretending to believe him, but my gut told me otherwise. A butcher, he said but there was an air of tension around him, a palpable aura of deception. What butcher works late on Halloween? To distract myself, I glanced back at the clock. Only a half hour left until my supposed freedom. As he started the machine, a gruesome symphony of sloshing filled the room, the red-tinted water swirling like a macabre dance. Time stretched on, each second an eternity, each tick of the clock a metronome for my escalating anxiety. Finally, the washing cycle ended, but the clothes were still stained, albeit lighter, a pale shade of pink now instead of vivid red. He pulled them out, looking defeated, and then turned to me with desperation in his eyes. Can I run them again? Please. My instinct screamed to refuse to usher him out and bolt the door, but a suffocating fear silenced me. I felt compelled to say yes, as if I had no other choice. 
Sure, I finally relented. Go ahead. He restarted the machine, this time adding a more generous pour of bleach. As the water ran clear, he sauntered over to me. Hey, wanna hear a scary story? A guttural voice inside me yelled, Say no, get out of this. But my external self betrayed me. Um, sure, why not? His eyes seemed to glint with an unholy light as he began his tale. It was dark. A story about a man tormented by a vile urge to kill. The narrative was detailed, too detailed. Narrating the story of a murder almost committed. He spoke of dark alleys, of a fallen woman, of bloodlust and an insatiable craving for violence. Each word hung in the air like a guillotine, waiting to drop. Halfway through, I couldn't bear it any longer. Stop, I don't want to hear any more, I interrupted, my voice tinged with both fear and revulsion. He smirked, as if he'd accomplished some invisible victory, just as the washing machine buzzed once more, signaling the end of the second cycle. He stuffed his now slightly less incriminating clothes back into the trash bag. As he left, I felt an immense, albeit uneasy, relief wash over me. The ordeal was over, or so I thought. I quickly closed shop and drove home, my hands trembling on the wheel, the darkness outside feeling more ominous than ever. I returned the next day to find police officers waiting. They'd been following a suspect through security cameras. The story the stranger had told me, it was no story. A woman had been found badly injured but alive. The details matched, down to the smallest, grisliest specifics. The man was still at large, his face now haunting my every thought, his tale echoing in the corners of my mind. From that day on, Halloween held a new meaning for me. It was no longer a night of fun and pretend, but a reminder of the real horrors that lurk in the shadows. And so I vowed never to work late on Halloween again, forever haunted by the memory of that fateful night. The engine purred as I maneuvered through the misty streets, my eyes darting between the road and the man in my rearview mirror. Every glance I stole made the atmosphere in the car a bit more stifling, a bit more intense. I couldn't see much of his face, but his eyes glinted in the dim light watching every turn I took. It felt like they were piercing through me, scrutinizing my every action. You know, in this job you're trained to gauge people, to read passengers for potential threats or dangers. And this guy, he was setting off alarm bells I didn't even know I had. But what could I do? Kicking him out didn't seem like a safe option, so I drove on, taking lefts and rights as he dictated from the back seat. The city seemed to melt away into unfamiliar terrain, almost as if I was driving into another realm. The car's interior was shrouded in a surreal silence, save for the low hum of the engine and the occasional crackling of the radio. All the while his instructions trickled in, each command colder than the one before. Turn left here. Go straight for two blocks. Take the next right. As we progressed, I noticed that the scenery outside was shifting in ways that seemed inexplicable. Familiar landmarks transformed into grotesque parodies of themselves. Neon lights flickered erratically, revealing hidden messages that my brain couldn't quite decode. Street signs twisted into malevolent shapes, their arrows pointing to fates unknown. It was as though reality itself was bending, conforming to the whims of my unsettling passenger. And then it hit me. We were driving through areas of the city that I had never seen before, past buildings that looked ancient yet new through districts that felt both foreign and uncomfortably familiar. I pondered whether to ask him for a destination, but my words caught in my throat. What would happen if I broke this oppressive silence? Would it shatter the illusion, or would it invite something far worse into the vehicle? I had heard rumors among other drivers of haunted fares, trips where you pick up passengers who lead you into otherworldly places or unspeakable situations, but I had always dismissed them as urban legends. However. With every passing minute, the story unfolding in my taxi was starting to feel like a haunting tale told to scare new drivers. I was snapped out of my thoughts by his voice, sharp and crisp. Stop here. I looked around. We were on a road that was simultaneously a cul-de-sac and a through street. Houses, if you could call them that, lined the pavement. Twisted, contorted structures that seemed to mock the very notion of architecture. He handed me an envelope. For your trouble, he said. The temptation to look inside was overwhelming but something told me it was a Pandora's box better left unopened. I took the envelope and placed it in the glove compartment without breaking eye contact with him. As for your tip, he said, leaning closer so that his shadowed face almost entered the beam of the overhead light. Be careful who you pick up on Halloween. Not everyone is wearing a costume. 
and with that he exited the car, melting into the darkness from whence he came. I hastily made a U-turn, and as if waking from a dream, I found myself back on familiar streets. When I finally mustered the courage to open the envelope, I found it filled with old rare coins, each one etched with symbols I'd never seen but somehow understood. That night left an indelible mark on me. The city seemed the same, but I knew better. It had hidden corners, blind spots where the walls between worlds wore thin. And as for me, I still drive my taxi. But when Halloween comes around, I remember the man in the trench coat and the fedora. And I wonder about the other drivers, those who may not have been as lucky as I was. What happened to them? Do they too roam unfamiliar streets in eternal twilight, forever ferrying enigmatic passengers to destinations unknown? I shudder at the thought and press on the accelerator, trying to outrun the memories that will forever haunt my midnight fares. The dashboard clock struck a 1 a.m. as I drove through deserted roads. Jack-o'-lanterns on porches flickered menacingly, as if mocking my internal turmoil. Even the usually comforting jazz tunes on the radio seemed distorted, as though the instruments themselves were warning me to stay alert. And then it happened. My phone pinged, signaling a new fare. I looked at the screen. No name, no profile picture, just a location. My heart sank as I recognized the area, a place disturbingly close to where I'd picked up the last ominous fare. For a moment I considered ignoring the request, but my curiosity got the better of me. I hit accept. As I pulled up to the pickup spot, I braced myself for the worst. But to my relief, a seemingly normal couple got into the back seat. Both were wearing costumes. He was dressed as a classic vampire and she as a witch. Good evening, the man greeted, his voice rich and warm. We'd like to go downtown if that's all right. I drove them to their destination, trying to engage in casual conversation. But my words felt clumsy and forced. My eyes kept darting to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that haunting face again. They seemed to sense my tension but attributed it to the busy Halloween night. When we finally reached downtown, they paid and got out, thanking me for the ride. Just as I was about to pull away, the man leaned back into the car. You know, it's not always the monsters you can see that you should be afraid of, he said, locking eyes with me. As they walked away, I sat there shivering despite the heater running at full blast. I started the car and drove aimlessly, trying to shake off the lingering unease. Each turn I took seemed random, yet somehow I felt as if I were being guided. And that's when I found myself back at that all-too-familiar cul-de-sac. The same twisted houses, the same eerie stillness. But this time there was something different. A figure standing in the middle of the road, dressed in a trench coat and fedora. I felt a chill run down my spine. Was it him? The same man? As if answering my silent question, the figure raised its head and even in the dim light I could see those piercing eyes looking back at me. He stepped forward and a voice crackled through the radio. Your journey isn't over yet. Some roads are destined to be traveled again. I gulped, my fingers gripping the steering wheel. Whether by fate or my own foolish choices, it looked like I was about to take another ride into the unknown. But this time, would I find my way back? I took a deep breath and drove toward the figure, my headlights cutting through the thick fog unveiling the mysteries that lay ahead. It was Halloween after all. A time when the boundary between the ordinary and the extraordinary blurs, and you're never really sure if you're the driver or just another passenger on a journey to destinations unknown. Halloween has always been my favorite holiday. Every year I put on a different disguise, knock on doors, and say those magic words, trick or treat. But last Halloween wasn't like the others. It was the year I found out that some tricks can be far more chilling than any treat, and sometimes the line between them is terrifyingly thin. The evening started off like any other Halloween night. I was responsible for taking my younger siblings, Sarah and Mark, trick-or-treating. They were buzzing with excitement, their little bags empty and ready to be filled with sugary loot. Sarah was dressed as a princess, her tiara sparkling under the streetlights, while Mark was going for the scary look as a miniature Dracula. Let's go to every house, Mark squealed, his plastic fangs making his words almost unintelligible. We'll try, I said, chuckling at his enthusiasm. But remember, we have to be home by nine. The neighborhood was alive with the spirit of Halloween. Ghoulish decorations adorned each house. Kids and adults alike roamed the streets in costumes, and an almost palpable aura of excitement was in the air. House after house, we collected candy and admired the often elaborate setups our neighbors had created. But as we reached the end of the street, 
we found ourselves standing before a house that was different from the others. Its windows were dark, the yard was overgrown, and the decoration seemed a little too real. A feeling of unease crawled up my spine, urging me to move along. Yet despite my better judgment, my eyes were drawn to a sign next to the front door. It read, For those who dare, more treats await in the backyard. Now I'm not one to shy away from a dare, but there was something unsettling about this. I looked at Sarah and Mark, their eyes wide with a mixture of fear and curiosity. Do we go? Sarah asked, her voice tinged with apprehension. I don't know, I replied. Something feels off about this. Yet even as I said it, the allure of the unknown tugged at me. What could be waiting for us in that dark backyard? More candy? A haunted setup or perhaps something far more sinister? I'll tell you this, the decision to walk through that gate and into the unknown was one I'd forever wish I could take back. But sometimes in life, especially on a night when the veil between worlds is at its thinnest, you make choices that change everything. And so, with a deep breath to steal myself, I led Sarah and Mark into the backyard. It was a decision that would reveal the haunting truth behind the tricks and treats of Halloween, a lesson I was about to learn in the most bone-chilling way possible. The moment we crossed the threshold into that backyard, the atmosphere changed. It was as if the very air grew colder, each exhale forming a misty cloud in front of us. The moon seemed to retreat behind a curtain of clouds, casting eerie shadows over what appeared to be an elaborate setup for Halloween scares. Ahead of us, animatronics cackled and lights flickered, revealing scenes of witches stirring cauldrons and skeletons rising from their graves. It was extraordinarily well done, almost cinematic in its detail. Wow, this is cool, Mark said, his eyes wide as saucers as he looked at the grim reaper that appeared to swipe its scythe at us as we walked by. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, Sarah admitted, although her eyes continually darted to the dark corners of the yard. As we moved deeper into the backyard, a low hum began to fill the air, an unsettling, discordant tune that made my skin crawl. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, observed like lab rats in a sinister experiment. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but some perverse curiosity urged me to continue. Finally, we reached what appeared to be the main attraction. At the center of the yard stood an enormous wooden door, ornate and weathered like something out of a fairy tale gone horribly wrong. A sign hung above it. Only the brave enter, will you? Mark glanced at me, then at Sarah. Should we? I really don't think it's a good idea, Sarah said, her voice wavering. I agree, I said, finally acknowledging the sinking feeling in my stomach. Let's go back. As we turned to leave, the door creaked open on its own, revealing an impenetrable darkness beyond. A gust of cold wind blew out from it, carrying with it a smell of damp earth and something else. Something rotten. It was a scent that I can only describe as the smell of decay. My heart raced. My instinct screamed at me to get out of there. But just then, a voice echoed from the darkness, a haunting whisper that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. Step inside and claim your treats. They're waiting for you. Something about that voice hypnotized me. It was as if my feet moved on their own, guiding me closer to the ominous doorway. I glanced back at Sarah and Mark. They looked horrified but equally captivated, as if the voice had cast a spell we couldn't resist. And then, with a sense of finality that sent shivers down my spine, I stepped through the door, and it swung shut behind us, plunging us into an all-encompassing darkness. The true terror of the night was about to unfold, and we were in too deep to turn back now. The darkness that enveloped us was a living thing, a choking void that seemed to swallow sound and light. My heart pounded so hard I was sure it echoed in the nothingness. Is everyone okay? I called out, my voice barely rising above a whisper. We're here, Sarah answered, her voice tinged with terror. Yeah, but where is here exactly? Mark's question hung in the air, unanswered. Before I could contemplate that, a flicker of light appeared, illuminating a new environment around us. It was as if we had been transported into a different realm. We were standing in a long, narrow corridor with walls made of rotting wood as though we were inside some ancient, decrepit building. At the end of the hallway was another door, but this one was different. It had two distinct panels one marked with a smiling jack-o'-lantern and the other with a skull. An antiqued plaque was mounted above them, reading, The choice is yours, sweets or screams. My eyes met Sarah and Mark's, a silent agreement passing between us. This was more than we had bargained for. I don't like this, Sarah said, her voice quivering. We need to get out of here. 
Before we could turn around, the voice returned, this time echoing from the walls themselves as if the very building was speaking to us. Ah, you've made it this far. You must choose a door. Sweets or screams, the decision is yours, but you cannot leave until you choose. My gut twisted into a painful knot. Something was terribly wrong. This was no mere Halloween prank. It felt malevolent, as if we were trapped in a maleficent game concocted by a twisted mind. I'm going for the jack-o'-lantern, Mark said suddenly, stepping toward the panel with determination. Come on, it's probably just candy behind that door. I grabbed his arm, my grip tighter than I intended. Are you sure? This doesn't feel right. He looked at me, then at Sarah, who nodded. We have to make a choice, right? Might as well get this over with. With that, Mark pushed open the jack-o'-lantern panel. A brilliant light spilled from the room, and for a moment we all hesitated at the threshold. Then, in an instant, Mark was yanked into the room as if pulled by an unseen force, and the door slammed shut behind him. Mark! Sarah screamed, lunging for the door. It wouldn't budge. We were paralyzed, shocked by the sudden turn of events. What had we gotten ourselves into? Then the skull door creaked open, revealing darkness so profound it seemed to absorb the faint light around us. The voice whispered again, a sadistic pleasure evident in its tone. You chose poorly. Now it's your turn. Sarah looked at me, her eyes filled with tears. What do we do now? I took a deep breath, my mind racing. If Mark had met an unimaginable fate through one door, what horrors awaited us through the other? But we had no choice. One of us had to go through. It was then that the unthinkable became clear. We were participants in a twisted game, and the only way to play was to make the most agonizing choice of all. Taking a deep breath, I looked at Sarah, my decision made. I'll go, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. You can't, what if... We don't have a choice, Sarah, I interrupted. It's the only way. And with that grim understanding, I stepped through the door marked with a skull, plunging once again into impenetrable darkness, leaving Sarah alone in the corridor. Whether it was a choice that would save us or doom us, only time would tell. But one thing was certain. That Halloween night would haunt us forever, a chilling reminder that some doors are better left unopened. As I stepped into the dark abyss, a chill ran down my spine, engulfing me in icy dread. The darkness was so profound it felt like a physical substance thick and oppressive. My feet shuffled forward hesitantly, the atmosphere thickening with each step. The anticipation was unbearable. Suddenly I heard footsteps behind me, quick, light footsteps. My mind raced. Was it Sarah, Mark, or something far worse? Who's there? I shouted into the dark void, my voice trembling. No answer. The footsteps grew louder, closer. Then just as abruptly everything went quiet, and a blinding light filled the room, disorienting me. When my eyes finally adjusted, I was back in the decrepit corridor with Sarah and unbelievably Mark. What just happened? Sarah exclaimed, rushing to hug me. I don't know. I stammered, but we need to get out of here now. Mark looked different, though. Paler, his eyes glazed over as if he had seen something unimaginable. You okay, man? I asked, concerned. Mark shook his head slowly. You don't want to know what's behind that door. Before we could probe further, the voice returned, now tinged with what sounded like regret. You have all made your choices, some wiser than others, it boomed. You are now free to go. As if on cue, the corridor faded away and we found ourselves back on the familiar streets, bathed in the glow of streetlights and the laughter of trick-or-treaters. It was as if we had never left, as if the whole nightmarish experience had been a dream. But we knew better. We knew that the horrors behind those doors were real, and that we had been part of a twisted game beyond our understanding. We should go, Sarah said, pulling us back to reality. Let's go home. As we made our way through the crowds of oblivious revelers, the chilling events of the night weighed heavy on our minds. We had been given a glimpse into a world of unspeakable horrors, a world that defied reason and logic. But one thing was clear, we had survived, and that was all that mattered. Mark, Sarah, and I never spoke of that night again, each of us locking away our experiences in a mental vault, too terrible to revisit. But every Halloween, as the sun sets and the shadows grow longer, I can't help but think about that fateful night and the unthinkable choices we were forced to make. I may never know the truth behind those haunted doors, but one thing is certain, I will never look at Halloween, the night of sweets or screams, the same way again. In the shadows of the night, if our tales from unsettling horror stories gave you a fright, press like and let it be known. Subscribe, so you're never alone in this haunting journey and share, so others too can be wary. 
Until our next sinister tale, stay dark, dear listener. <laughs>